and Mike Cutler, welcome to The Deep End. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to speak with you on like 15 different levels. I want to start here by going a bit into your background as relates to this broad series we're doing. Um, with this series on the deep end, we're really interested in how problems in the technology industry intersect with problems in the real world, which directly leads into your background as a reporter um, at TechCrunch. Must, must, much of your beat intersected with that intersection of technology and then problems in public policy. Can you just explain what that beat looked like and how, as a venture capitalist, you're now thinking about some of those issues today? Yeah, I, I, that was, I mean, it wasn't my intention to cover, like, this is a thing that I kind of ended up when, I mean, you're a reporter and you follow crumb by crumb of story by story, and then it becomes like a much larger piece or a, a much larger thread of a much larger issue. And so like, you know, I had been covering tech and early stage finance for many, many years. And then in the mid 2010s, I was just feeling and noticing a lot of um, kind of stress in between uh, the, the technology industry, which had just by then really started, really like came into its own as a force within San Francisco and the tensions with the broader Bay Area community, which is where I had grown up and where my family's been for, you know, like 70 years. And, um, and you know, I started to ask questions about why the built environment in Silicon Valley looked the same as it did in the 1950s or the 1970s. Why, you know, the region was producing these trillion dollar companies and yet, you know, the place was covered in kind of strip malls and flat commercial office parks and really poor public transit. Um, and I wanted to know why, because it seemed like if we had all this, you know, creative ingenuity, uh, technological innovation, we should be able to do something that's so much more substantial. And so I started pulling on different threads and realizing, you know, looking into the history of housing, infrastructure, public finance, um, and started to realize, you know, basically, you know, after the mid 20th century, when we had built all these suburbs and had this great period of American prosperity, um, you know, a generation into that, we, st you know, the the f folks who had come in, the generation that had come into power, started enacting all kinds of restrictions and veto points um, around getting, you know, everything from very small projects to very large projects um, through, you know, our system. And so, um, whereas it had been really easy to build a lot of housing in the 1950s, it became substantially more and more difficult over time through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. And so I kind of wanted to unpack all those different little pieces and choices that, you know, our community had made, you know, in little micro steps, but not realizing what we had had done overall over the the long period. And that that you know I started writing about it. I wrote a really long like thirteen thousand word story about it, that convinced a lot of people. That convinced like three or four really key individuals to leave their jobs and start housing advocacy orgs. One of which I'm on the board of, which is California EMB. Um, which is a 501c4, we pack, we pass like, I mean, we do about, I wanna say at this point, like California is involved with about changing like at around a half dozen or six California state laws a year around kind of untangling all of these res different restrictions that we put in place. And then in parallel to that, um, I, I joined Initialized Capital and have led a lot of deals in exactly you know the, the the area that you're talking about, which is just where software and tech meets the real world, and that encompasses every, encompasses everything from kind of prop tech, housing affordability, to construction, to um, to, to climate tech. So you know you know when when some people write essays like it's time to build, like I actually put my money to work there, and I put our our firm's money to work there. Million follow-ups there too. I'd love to hear from you about what some of those restrictions or obstacles are. So, if you're sitting, let's say, in 2015, broader Bay Area, what are the obstacles in the way of building, construction, housing, those different things? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of pieces we've already started to untangle. You know, some of which are things like height limits, uh, floor area limits. You know, the amount of built space you can you know like how much how much of a given lot you can cover in a building um, or into built or with a built project versus like how much has to be left for parking um, parking parking um, uh, minimums that kind of stuff and so that that stuff we've actually made um, a, I would say like a pretty significant amount of progress on over the last five years um, 
you know, we passed in California, we passed an AD, an ex accessory dwelling unit law, which makes it really easy to build backyard units and granny flats and made a more straightforward ministerial process around that. Because prior to that, like, you know, there are a lot of cities where, you know, you could just, you know, pay $600 and then file like a, uh, an objection or a complaint about the project and then tie it up for, I don't know, you know, weeks or months. Um, you know, we still have this law called the, uh, called the California Environmental Quality, like CEQA. It's a, like a environmental law passed in the 70s, really well intended, part of a really, um, you know, powerful movement that had a lot of really good, good outcomes. Um, at the same time, that law, CEQA, was also used to block all kinds of housing developments in already built areas that are already developed. Um, and so there, there definitely needs to be some fine tuning around that. I mean, a, a very notable example is um, UC Berkeley's trying to build a student housing on a lot that has, um, you know, on a lot that has a lot of, that, that has been, they've been unable to build on for the last 60 years. And they, they came out with a proposal that would include both student housing and homeless housing. And now it's being, um, you know, just, it was getting litigated because like student noise is an environmental um, quality, you know, an environmental issue, which is absurd. So um, there's lots of little things like that, you know. So there's the zoning restrictions, there's the process that allows people to oppose or block, tie things up for months with small, um, inexpensive processes. And then there's like, you know, environmental law being abused. And something I'd love to hear then is what is the direct relation, let's say, to Silicon Valley? So um, the relation of the ability for someone to purchase a house or to live close to work, like how, do you, how does tech, separate from the, like how responsible is tech for this issue question, how do you think these dynamics you're describing really affect like a person who's trying to become a founder or someone who's working at an early stage company? How do you think about that? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's actually a funny story. There's a famous old Tom Wolf story uh, about the founders of Intel um, in the 1960s, how they founded the company. And there was just a, this amazing little anecdote about how one of the founders, you know, realized that they had to move out to the Bay Area and they brought their family out. And then they saw a bunch of houses that morning in Mountain View and then purchased a house by the afternoon on their literally their first or second day. And, you know, I think about my own family um, on my mom's side, they are Vietnamese refugees. Um, a family of uh, six sisters, and they were able to come here as refugees in the you know mid to late seventies, and they were able to buy a house together. I mean, cumulative together in San Jose. I want to say around nineteen eighty or nineteen eighty one. And so, just thinking about those stories, they seem totally unfathomable today. Like, could a person just show up and buy a house the same day on the peninsula in Silicon Valley? That no, that's you know people have to have you know, an exit, an exit to do that um, or be like a FANG employee for many years. And so um, it is really meaningful. And, you know, I, you know, my family has had many generations of immigrants come to, to, to work in the technology industry in Silicon Valley. And it's just going through that process of the 2010s and realizing how restrictive um, and how difficult it would be for a person in my parents or grandparents shoes to do the same thing um, or me or whatever. Uh, that's really hard because I'd really like to have a barrier that's really welcoming and inclusive of all kinds of talent from all over the country and the world. You know, something I'm curious about, I'm recording this um, from Austin, which is a, a city that's deeply integrated into the tech industry, obviously, but also there's a lot of debate around housing and growth and those different dynamics. To what degree do you think the problems that you're encountering in California are actually broader problems in the United States as a whole? I, I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap. I think that that you know now with remote work, you know the tensions that we were seeing here are now you can see them in Montana, you can see them in Texas, you can see them you can see them in a lot of places. Um, you know, you could see them in the rent growth that Florida has experienced over the last two years since the pandemic. Um, and so, um, I, I I think California is a, a you know like a canary in the coal mine for lots of other issues that other cities other cities do face and will face. Now, I mean, Texas is has different, you know, geographical or geological aspects in its favor. It isn't, you know, it isn't on an earthquake zone. It doesn't have huge 
mountain terrain that becomes very difficult to build on once you've built out the flatlands. There's like a lot of flatland in Texas. And so, you know, the cities in Texas, Houston, Dallas, um, you know, they've been able to grow kind of concentrically outward in a way that has given uh, residents in, of, of those cities like a lot more capacity to um, access affordable housing stock. I mean, Houston is obviously known for that, which it, with it, you know, it has a very different, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't use traditional zoning in the way that other cities do. Um, that said, the affordability problems are real. Um, you know, you know my, you, Texas kind of has the property tax system that California sort of used to have before the 1970s. And so like as your home value appreciated, your property taxes rise. And so that can create affordability issues for current homeowners in the way that Californians don't experience. So like California has this law where if you buy a house, your property tax is kind of um, uh, affixed or like capped at a certain rate of growth. Um, it can only, your property tax uh, can only grow at, you know, maybe one, I think it's like 2% and then no more than 1% every year. Um, and so, you know, if you're a, per, a person who bought a home in the 70s, your tax rate might be a f like a minuscule fraction of your neighbor's um, tax uh, assessment. Um, and so that keeps homeowners in their homes, but it creates all kinds of weird, perverse incentives around development and around um, kind of city and municipal behavior. Um, that make it really hard for new people to come in and afford uh, to live in the state. You know, I'm really curious when you're telling um, the history of 20th century, 20th century housing and the expectations that really built into how folks who are coming up sort of see their housing opportunities. What what would you say on a personal level is your like ideal vision? for what housing looks like. So if I think of that 20th century model, I think of you go to the city and then you go move to the suburbs and the cycle just kind of continues forever and ever and ever um, onwards. Like what would be your own personal vision of how that works or if it could be seen? I think, I think people should have more choice. And by more choice, what I mean is, you know, if someone wants to stay, well, I mean, one issue with, with, you know, a lot of American city zoning is, um, you know, it's really hard to zone and finance for large units in, in kind of your city centers. I mean, so we end up, you know, what, the, the life cycle that you're describing is a function of the choices that we've made. Um, you know, in other countries, in big cities, a family can choose to ha raise a family in the summers, but they can also choose to be in a city center because there's more unit types that accommodate like larger households. Um, and there are definitely some cities who have made positive steps in that direction, like Vancouver, you know, is very intentional about zoning for families in the city center, but American cities are mostly not. Historically, what we've done is said, you know, you have office towers in the center and then you have suburbs for housing on the outside. And, you know, if you look at our regional transit system, BART was really designed around the suburban commuter commuting into the central business district. And now, obviously, post COVID, we're going to have we have we, we're not going to have we are having um really serious conversations around wow well like what is going to be the use of our central business district what is its future going forward what kind of occupancy can we expect and you know that it's a very very complex problem around city incentives and what building owners want to do um, but there's also a lot of opportunity there in terms of thinking about like we can have more housing more distributed in more places so people have more choice about where and how they want to live um, instead of being kind of shoehorned into these um, these like more prescriptive specific options. So here's a question I really want to know your answer to. So on what level did the COVID era remote work dynamic kind of upend what you're discussing? A, in the sense that obviously remote work hypothetically creates an escape hatch if I'm a founder, early stage employee, um, hypothetically, if my company is remote friendly, I don't have to try to get a house in the Bay Area. I could live somewhere else that's cheaper. But then two, if I marshal 20 something up and coming, have the ability to live somewhere else, hypothetically, that could force a region to be more competitive with its housing, with its housing stock because there's not just the same um, guarantee that people are going to live there. To what degree were the two dynamics I just described true or not? Um, I would say they're very true. I mean, I mean, you look at the the pricing and the rental movement and the rental market, it's very obvious that 
like the San Fr- the Bay Area market is soft, both in homeownership and rental pricing relative to other regions, because people do have more choice. They can choose to be here. They can choose to be in another city that aligns with their lifestyle more or that is closer to where they grew up or their family or their extended networks. Um, and I do think it's going to make it's going to make cities much more um, going to have to be more competitive and more thoughtful about how they um, incentivize people to live there. I, th- I do think it's going to be much more complicated. Like, you know, a, you know, the conventional package of I'm going to give some business tax breaks. Like, I think that's a lot more complicated now because even if you offered it to their business, would their employees actually be there? Would the jobs actually be there? I don't, I don't really know. And so I think that kind of incentivizes cities to compete more on um, probably lifestyle and amenities. Yeah. So another question that I want to ask, I'd like to just think about this whole frame, given the varieties of experiences that you have. So this broader series that we're doing on the deep end right now is focused on, hey, there are these big problems. There are ways that startups and technology can address those problems outside of traditional processes. What do you think about that idea? Like in the sense that there's a version of you who wasn't a reporter who wasn't joining the board, you know, the Yimby board, and just instead was like working on um, your startup. Like, to what degree are these interchangeable as means of enacting change? Um, I've always, I mean, I, I think that if you kind of look at the choices that I've made, I think a central thesis of like what what I do and how I operate is that you need to do both. Um, I mean, if you were dealing with software only, I mean. Even software only problems are not software only problems anymore. Like, I mean, you look at like how much um, Facebook, TikTok, like all of them have to now engage with Congress and and what that, you know, the implications of what their products do and, you know, manifest at scale. Or if you look at the implications of large language models and um, the whole Pandora's box that's going to open, like everything, you know, you can build in the private sector, but I I do think that you also need to have a strong, you know, especially as you scale a company, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily do this like pre-Series B, but like Series B and above, I do think that if you know there are going to be a lot of, you know, community, society, public policy implications of what you're doing, I think it's good to invest in that early. Um, And so, I mean, obviously the choices I've made are around being highly engaged, you know, like investing in private sector entrepreneurs that are attacking this problem, but also being highly engaged in in, in the public policy world. And so like, you know, of, of like a lot of the deals I've done, uh, I've invested in companies doing like factory built uh, prefab housing. Um, I invested in a company called Abodu that is doing accessory dwelling units and they have been doing them up and down the West Coast from Seattle to San Diego, San Diego, making it really easy to add, a, you know, a second or sometimes even third unit to an existing lot. Um, and that's a meaningful form of housing, especially as we have, you know, like a lot of aging Americans and folks that um, you know, might want to age in place or age with, you know, extended families. Um, and I've also done, um, I've done a lot of deals in like construction efficiency. We invested in a company in Southern California called Curry that is doing last mile delivery of construction supplies. Um, as you know, like, I mean, I would say, you know, 20, 2014 to 2020, I was doing a lot on zoning and in post COVID and post, um, you know, in this current environment, um, I feel like, a lot of the progress we've made on zoning and, and um, kind of um, like process restrictions, like we have the ball moving on that, and there's lots of changes happening every year at the California state level. I mean, the you know the biggest bottleneck right now is 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 financing as a result of you know the Fed's sudden changes in interest rate policy um, and supply chain issues. So like we're doing a lot on um, you know helping construction supplies get to their destinations faster. Um, I've also invested in a company that's focused on on permitting. Um, so, you know, we're attacking a lot of different areas. There's lots of things that founders can do to make processes um, more efficient. And, you know, a lot of these industries are very complex and have lots of specialty jobs that are, in fact, enormous markets. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot for entrepreneurs to do, but we also have to simultaneously have um, kind of the, uh, the h- humility and reality that, like, you know, understand the reality that like, um, you know, the government, government engagement and, you know, government policies are a huge part of our, um, you know, a huge part of addressing this question as well. 
I want to zoom in on your construction point. I'm sure you see this tweet go viral every once in a while where it shows um, in China, they're building a factory or a house or an apartment building just super, super, super quickly with the obvious implication that in the United States, such a process is not happening as quickly. If you're thinking about that real stereotype of our construction discourse, is the difference in speed, does that come down to the supply chains on goods are better in a country like China. Um, the materials are more efficient or more easily reproducible. The permitting uh, regime is better. Um, how, how do you think about like those types of bifurcated dynamics? Um, I mean, I, I mean, well, you know, they're, they're certainly a more, they're, you know, like they're, they're a soft authoritarian government. So like if they want to, if they want to plan something at a federal level, they're going to do it regardless of, um, any implications or downstream consequences it has for lots of other, you know, types of constituents, you know, whether those are like Han Chinese constituents or minorities or whatever. Um, we don't have that process here that our process, um, is, you know, in the, in, in the, after the 1950s and sixties, after we had a more technocratic approach, top-down approach towards development in this country, um, a lot of things happened like freeways were built in primarily African-American neighborhoods and that had environmental and health consequences for those communities. And so, and then, you know, also they also tried to build in white communities as well. And um, there were freeway revolts in the Bay Area. And um, as a result of that, there was a whole set of processes and laws that were added to add more bottoms up feedback into, into the system. Now, you know, I would say that like, I mean, if you followed you know some of Ezra Klein's recent interviews, or even folks on 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 that side of the, like the political spectrum, they would say like maybe some of those laws have gone too far and added too many um, too many choke points um, in a, into our development process, such that we have like a kind of a vetocracy where any small kind of interest group can can plug up uh, um, a project of any size. Um, so you know there's definitely a process, a kind of like a uh, you know, a, a process that needs to happen now in our political system around kind of tweaking those laws to make sure they give bottoms up input into a, into like a, a development process, but also don't let, you know, that stand in the way of much needed, you know, like, like student and homeless housing, for example. <laughs> yeah. You know, something we haven't talked about, but a lot of your investments intersect with this is uh, the commuting topic like what's your philosophy around commutes and how are some of the startups here like investing in or working with like thinking around that question um i don't actually know if i have that many commuting um related investments i mean i i do think for a large subset of careers like remote work is really transformative and we have folks that are in the office only a few days a week versus um every day of the week um but I, 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 you have to ask, a, what, do you, what do you mean? Yeah, like, so I think, a, I think an example of that would be probably cul-de-sac. Yeah. Um, so like car-free neighborhoods, yeah. like the dynamics like that. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think that, again, this goes back to this question of choice. Like, we've been offered a very specific menu of choices in this country. Like, you can, you can, you know, you've got to live in your suburban home and drive everywhere if you want to raise a family. Um, but we don't have other options. We don't have, there aren't that many other options for that because like our, the, the downtown, the walkable neighborhoods that have, you know, in recent decades commanded a price premium, um, to non-walkable neighborhoods haven't been offered in, in abundance to, to folks. And so like, you know, Ryan Johnson, I mean, who should, maybe you should have him on your show. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he grew up in Phoenix. He and his co-founder are multi-generation Arizonans, and he loves he loves bikes, e-bikes, mobility. He loves walkable neighborhoods and communities, and he's doing something pretty extraordinary there. He's building like I, I toured it a few months ago, and it, you walk through it, and it feels like I don't know. It almost kind of feels like walking through like an old neighborhood in Spain or Greece or something, but it's in the middle of Arizona. Um, and they've done really an exceptional job with kind of seeding that whole project with um, 
um, with different community stakeholders in the form of like their F and B partners and. They've leased out everything that they have. They fully leased out everything that they put on the market so far. Um, but yeah, no, he, I mean, that's really about offering more choice. And so the more that they're able to do it in more um, historically car centric cities in America, that goes towards this idea that people should have different kinds of living options. You know, something I'm really curious about is um, kind of going back to how your journalistic deep engagement with these issues, writing experience, prepped you to be a VC, prepped you to be a board member, because I think a lot of founders or ambitious persons who are listening to this kind of conversation are gonna see different parts of your background appeal to themselves or be something that they've themselves engaged with. So how do you think about how the like professional side of this all fits together with kind of like the deeply serious policy stuff we're talking about? Um. I mean, I think that being a reporter makes you really curious about the world, want, makes you want to ask lots of questions. Um, it definitely certainly makes you a great like networker. Like I, I, you know, as a result of my career, I know so many different founders and people and people in so many different intersections of life. Um, and I have a lot of access to different viewpoints. And I understand like if a founder is going to tackle like a really hard, complicated problem, like, you know, climate or <laughs> or housing affordability. Um, there's folks that you have to know on the private sector side who are great at scaling companies, and there are folks that you have to know to kind of you know, get things moving to make what they're doing possible on the public policy side. And typically, like these types of companies require you know, engagement a little bit earlier than other types of companies. What's your advice for serving on a board of a policy organization? Um, not not just getting there, but just it's. If, if, let me put it this way: like I come from the DC space, and if there's one thing I picked up doing this podcast, it's that a a 501 C anything is desperately different than a startup environment on a couple of different levels. Yeah. How would you think about navigating that if you're someone who's listening and interested in getting to that type of? Yeah, world? I mean, I definitely have enjoyed being on boards of newer organizations. Like, um, I think if you, I think. It might be harder to navigate like a long-standing one that's been around second several decades that has lots of ways and particular practices of doing things. Um, you know, the thing that I've liked about being on the California Indie Board is it is like being on a startup. Um, you know, half the board are like either founders or other investors, and so the level and caliber of management advice um, that Brian Hanlon is getting is, I mean, it's it's wonderful. And then obviously half the board are, are public policy folks, and so it's just this wonderful mix of just all the ins and outs and the nitty gritty of the, the political process, like what laws and who, who needs what votes for what to get something through, but also just a really, really high caliber um, level of just managerial and organizational management advice. So um, yeah, I, 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 you know, like I definitely prefer like, you know, being part, you know, if you're standing up a new org that exists to have be around, um, you know, like a, another org that I kind of, um, that I, I helped stand up in the last year. There's an Megafires org that um, is run by, uh, basically they're advocating for more federal funding and focus on wildfire mitigation. Um, and I and a couple other uh, venture investors and folks put that together because um, obviously wildfire is a major issue in California. <laughs> um, but that's also another one where you're like standing up a new org, you have new, you have new goals, like how do you get to, you know, a million, you know, a million acres in California doing prescribed burns a year or how do you get to like a meaningful um, kind of federal allocation of dollars towards um, not just like you know the like the like almost military like response of firefighters to a fire that's already way out of control, but getting in all that stuff that is sort of preventative and early around um, you know I, I don't know if this is well known to you, but like. Um, you know, in California has a long, California is like designed to burn. It, it basically, it's, it's trees, you know, some, many of its most famous trees reproduce through wildfire. So wildfire is kind of a necessary part of our environment, but it, you know, in the last century, we've kind of suppressed it in an unnatural way. And we need to go back to a practice of doing like low level, low intensity prescribed burns that take out a lot of brush that contributes to these really explosive out of control fires. Um, and so we have to do more around um, proactive measures of managing the issue rather than reactive. And so we've stood up, we've stood up an organization around that. And so I kind of prefer, 
um, finding great political talent and then kind of unleashing them on a significant advocacy problem and then working with other folks in the public sector and and, in the uh, the venture world to do that. You just hinted at an interesting debate that comes up whenever anyone I encounter in the broader Silicon Valley space who's interested in addressing an issue is going to inevitably confront the debate over does change come about by starting something new um, or by integrating yourself into a legacy system that quote unquote knows how things work? Because obviously if you are coming from a tech space, I think a lot of your, um, not just like personal preferences, but a lot of the narratives that you have are built around, you have legacy ossified organizations and our jobs as founders, investors, et cetera, are to like stand up new things that can improve upon those models. How do you think about that debate? Because I just think that there sometimes, I think in your case, you have the right background to be able to adjudicate like when something new is value add. But I also just know there's been a million, let's just say, uh, failed side projects the past two years that if that energy had been put into integrating into, like, I don't know, attending the local city council meeting where the vitocracy actually goes down, something useful could have happened. Like, how, how do you think about this? Um, I, I think it's totally case by case. I, I, I mean, you, you kind of pointed it out, like I'm gonna adjudicate each case and look at it. Like, I think every public yeah. po every problem is different. And I mean, specifically in the case of California and me, like, there were there what you know we literally did evaluate a number of different approaches and Brian Hanlon looked at it and he realized like trying to jam yourself through a hundred city council meetings is just not a scalable or effective approach and the more effective thing to do was to go through Sacramento and so he he set up a new organization to go through Sacramento um, I mean I'm also involved you know like I also participate and involved in older organizations as well but I just and, and the other thing I would say is like, specifically in the end megafires org, like the, the person who's in charge of that is Matt Weiner, who is like, oh, it's a new org, but like he was, he, he was the point person for um, managing the California congressional delegation. And he's a really seasoned hand, both in state and federal politics. And so like, you know, we found oftentimes you're taking people who are part of the legacy system, who know it and who have lots of social capital and political capital in that world and um, you're giving them the capacity to, you know, recognize like I can't do everything inside the system, but if I had, you know, some free, you know, some freedom from all of the restrictions of being in, in that world, but I can like apply it from the outside, then they can have um, a lot more leverage. As we're, we're nearing the end, I want to just hit at uh, two other areas and sectors that you invest in that have been hinted upon, but we haven't been very explicit about. So you, you mentioned just like climate tech and then you mentioned like prop tech. Um, could you just discuss those two areas and how they intersect with this broad conversation of your investment sure. focus? Yeah, no, so we, we, we've done, I mean, I've done a couple climate tech deals. Um, one is in um, like relatedly a, like a wildfire detection system um, called Pano. Um, they are building a full stack hardware software system that helps uh, communities and governments from Colorado, Washington, Australia, um, manage and uh, detect wildfires and then maintain situ situational awareness through the, the season if, you know, between prescribed burns and then non, non intentional wildfires. Um, so I've, I've, that, that is a bet around climate adaptation. Um, and, you know, there, there's also, I've also done a deal in a direct air capture company. I mean, I think I'm just really, Again, this is like a similar problem. Um, you take unleashed entrepreneurs, you try to attack real world problems that need to get addressed, um, but you also engage uh, you know, in public policy. You do both. And um, you know, having some, been someone again who's been you know, a lifelong Californian, um, you know, I grew up in the state and I remember September's and October's being hot, but not like, not like, you know, not like a scene out of Dante's Inferno, you know? Um, so like, literally. Um, yeah. And I mean, I mean, you know, of the bad seasons that we had a couple years ago, I mean, a lot of, a lot of it, frankly, unfortunately is already baked in given like the cumulative carbon emissions that we've already had. So even if we are able to, you know, reach, you know, you know, not reach, but like, you know, very get, get to somewhere close to, um, you know, Pierce Agreement goals. Um, you know, there's still a lot of there's still a lot of significant changes that have already been baked into um, you know how how much the Earth is warmed already. Um, and so I just feel, you know, I have I have kids. Like I want to have 
a world that's you know that's that's nice to live in for them i don't want them to like be breathing un unchokable unbreathable air and so we've got to do what we can you know your your reference to being a lifelong californian gets at an ever-present high stakes low stakes discourse that's been going on for the past few years which is just the debate over like where should you be if you're building you could move to austin you could move to new york city you could move to miami of course now it's I think fashionable, at least on Twitter, take with that what you may, to kind of say, okay, I'm, I had my time off, I'm moving back to the Bay Area. <laughs> right? How, how do you think about just the where should you be building discourse? Um, it, again, depends on what you wanna build. Like if you're building something in you know, e-commerce or fashion, obviously it might make sense to be in New York or Los Angeles. Um, if you're building, I mean, if you're, I mean, and then even 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 if there's some notable companies like OpenAI in San Francisco, I mean, like my understanding is that com the AI community is really widely dispersed as well. So like, um, I do. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I I'm here in part because my you know my family's here and my community's here. That said, like, I just know. I mean, like you can't like I I've said this. I was like, you know, it's like betting betting against the Bay Area is like betting against. James Cameron and like, you know, he disappeared in this whole like, what is this Avatar 2? And then Avatar 2 comes out and it's like a two billion dollar movie. That's, that's like the Bay Area. Like, it, you know, it goes through its phases. I've been through many phases like, you know, in the 2000s when we went through the first crash and it was like, where are the jobs going? Are the jobs even going to be in America? And then of course, like it came back and there's just a huge depth of talent here. And I mean, this doesn't, this doesn't like, denigrate or take away from other cities that you can build in. Like I'm, we have lots of companies every, everywhere. And I'm, you know, we don't, we're, we're not prescriptive with our founders. Like you need to be here to do your company. Um, we, I don't think we have really, I don't think I, I don't think we really have advice like that. We don't tell founders you need to be here. Like, you know, if I think about, you know, some of the other companies we have in the por portfolio, like, you know, Curry's and Curry's and Ventura and, um, you know, they've been able to build like a really tight knit company and culture there, um, which is very distinct from what you'd experience in Northern California. Um, so, you know, I, I think that you can build a great company anywhere. I think it's highly dependent on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and, and then as a firm, we're not really prescriptive about where you need to be. Even if I am a Bay Area lifer, even if I am. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm, I'm so glad you used the uh, James Cameron Avatar 2 metaphor because it kind of gets at, I think, good advice for folks in the sense that before Avatar 2 came out, there was a lot of discourse of, there are no memes about Avatar. It's not culturally in the discussion. Like, how could this be successful? <laughs> and no memes really emerged out of Avatar 2 after you know a week or so. So you kind of could say, okay, we've all moved on, yet the movie's chugging its way um, to $2 billion worldwide. It suggests that founders, um, builders, basically everyone, we shouldn't be too dis we, we shouldn't be too distracted uh, from discourse. He's he's a man discourse. who is just focused on you know, his stories are not very complex, but he's focused on, you know, pushing the technological edge of storytelling. And that's what he's been doing his entire career. And he's been laser focused on that. And there are a lot of founders like that. And I think the Bay Area as a region is kind of like that. It's just like, it'll go through its phases and people will say it's out of the fashion. And then there will be some people or some person <laughs> that have been checking away quietly for, you know, however many years and then boom, GPD-4, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so I think the, the last big question here is, um, we're talking about building, we're talking about big problems, like what would, if you could just, and this isn't, this isn't the same as a request for startups question because this is me more asking 2014, 2015, Kim, what are other big problems that you think in the year 2023, like we're not in the 2010s anymore, um, founder personality type folks, enterprising journalists, et cetera, um, activists and organizations should be focused on like other than the ones that we've described here on the housing issue it's really like right now it's really a, a rates financing issue um so i mean i think that's that's obviously much more of a public policy problem it's it's like we're trying to attack inflation but we're also crushing we're also like long term actually crushing the housing pipeline and housing affordability and in, in reality we probably should be engaging in more like other policies like 
I don't know, immigration and childcare that would enable like more labor to be unlocked in our economy such that we're not running at this overheated pace and the Fed is in this kind of no win position of inflation and banking crises. Um, so that, I mean, that, that that's a very complicated one, but I mean, I think climate continues to be, climate, you know, is going to also have its waves of where it's very hot and out of fashion and it's gonna, but it is a problem that's going to be continuing. And we're looking at a number of companies from ones that are on the bleeding edge of the frontier, um, where it's like, does this work? Can this work? Is there a market? To ones that are doing a lot of kind of low hanging fruit of, you know, the IRA unlocked a lot of um, incentives and capital around electrification for for regular Americans, whether that's in their homes, their cars, whatever. Um, there's definitely a lot of low hanging fruit around that. There, there about like making those processes easy, more seamless, um, no more no brainer for for consumers. Yeah, and actually, here's the real last question: To what degree is a lot of the it's time to build um, ambitious policy-minded energy, like a zero interest rate phenomenon, um, that's going to get lost as folks kind of struggle through like the hard times? Like, because that's my concern. I'm curious if you have that concern or if you see that at all. Um, I see it. I mean, I do think that anybody. I mean, the reality is, and if you're doing anything that has like a real world component, like. Like whether you're in a low interest rate regime or a high interest rate regime on a relative basis, it's always, it's n never going to get the same, it's, it's going to be hard for it to get the same level of widespread in investor interest because, you know, software margins are what software margins are, right? And like you look at a software margin versus real, like those are different, those are different businesses. And so like in a low interest rate regime, I mean, these companies were, you know, these companies are able to raise funding at the same time, you know, there's lots of other, you know, there's like NFTs and lots of other stuff being funded. Right. And then in a high interest rate regime, um, you know, climate continues to be climate, climate deals and climate investments continue to be really hot. I mean, even even considering all of those things, there's a lot of com competition over them, um, even at the later and growth stages. So um, for now, not not super concerned, but I definitely you know, share some of the questions that you're having for sure. That's an excellent place to leave it. Um, Kim, thank you so much for joining us on The Deep End. Great, thank you.